Now, Gavin, on this show, we take the train, not taxis. Who do you think you are? Tom Price? Ass. The following podcast contains... Now, <laughs> cursing is not something that most comedians do. Sorry for cursing. I want you to stop cursing. I've been, I've been using all the wrong swear words. Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you just replaced uppity with ungrateful before your racist epithet, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host Dave Bledsoe and this is a Friday, September 29, 2017, Kneel Before Trump Zod edition of the show where we talk protest, patriotism, and the angry white people who don't even watch football. Stay tuned. The What the Hell Are You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Frank's Flag Shack for all your flag needs. How better to show your deep reverence for the Stars and Stripes than plastering it all over your bloated, pale, saggy body by wearing an American flag apparel item from Frank's Flag Shack. Flag shirts, we got them. Flag shorts, you betcha. How about a skimpy flag kini? You're damn right. Nothing shows your love of country like taking its flag, wearing it on a cut-off sleeveless t-shirt, and spilling cheap domestic beer all over it while hooting like an idiot at a sporting event. Act now and Frank's flags will include our exclusive Old Glory Adult Diaper. Because if you're covered in piss and full of shit, you might as well wrap your shame in an American flag. I was over in Australia and I was like, are you proud to be an American? I was like, oh, I don't know. I didn't have a lot to do with it, you know. I, my parents fucked there, that's about all. I, you know, I was in the spirit realm at that time. So I went, fucking perish, fucking perish. But they couldn't hear me because I didn't have a mouth. I was a spirit without lungs or a mouth or vocal cords. They fucked here. Okay, I'm proud. I hate patriotism. I can't stand it, man. It makes me fucking sick. It's a round world last time I checked, okay? You know what I mean? I hate patriotism. In fact, that's how we can stop patriotism, I think. Instead of putting stars and stripes on our flags, we should put pictures of our parents fucking. <laughs> gather people around that flag and see your dad hunched over your mom's big four by four butt. See if any boon rally mentality can circle around that little fucking image. God damn, I'm out of here. Fuck it. <laughs> you got your mom, shut up. Let's go garden. There are times when I feel as though the actual name of the show should be What Are White People Angry About This Week? which I admit is clunky, but no less clunky than what the hell were you thinking? I say this because as a group, white people are simply the most aggrieved beings on the planet. Every week we're finding upsetting new things to rant and rave about, and it's exhausting. I know this because I myself am a white person, and I too am constantly angry. The big difference between myself and most of my white brothers and sisters is that the only thing I'm angry at is other white people. Some of my best friends are white people. <laughs> this week's wage du jour, although by the time I finish recording this show it could very well be something different, is of course the National Football League. It seems the pasty pales of America are very displeased that some of the players in that august institution might not be properly reverent of Merca. They honestly do not know what is wrong with you people. You people? Well, I, I, I mean, they, they, they say it's not about, you know, th those people. But since the protest is about white cops killing unarmed those people, and then the white cops are given a pat on the head, a slap on the ass, an admonishment not to do it again if there's anyone watching, it's hard for any rational thinking person to see it any other way. Since we're not dealing with rational or indeed thinking people, they blithely maintain their utter innocence while at the same time repeating overtly racist rhetoric. Oh, and speaking of overtly racist rhetoric, what's Donald Trump doing today? The entire football situation was running fairly well under the radar until the races in chief took to the state of Alabama a week ago, ostensibly to stump for Big Luther Strange for Alabama senator, who just lost this week to an absolute theocrat homophobe and even bigger races. But it's Alabama, so you have to expect these things. But instead of actually stumping for Big Luther, he did what he does so well and devolved into a bloviating rant about black football players kneeling during the national anthem. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag? 
to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now. Out. He's fired. He's fired. What did this have to do with the Senate race? Nothing. Not directly. What did it have to do with race relations in America? Everything. All right, let's talk about how this began. Well, it all began with the Dutch going to East Africa and kidnapping with a bunch of African and making them slaves. But that's the long version of this story, and my script doesn't say anything about the way back yet. Now, the kneeling protest during the national anthem began just last year when San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick remained seated during the national anthem at a preseason game. Kaepernick was doing so as a quiet protest over police violence against African Americans. Then, after a conversation with his fellow player and fellow and former Green Beret Nate Boyer, Kaepernick began kneeling on the sidelines during the anthem. I showed him a text message from a good friend of mine who's still in the Special Forces, and he said, Nate, I was just standing on the tarmac as a plane came back from, from Afghanistan to drop off a coffin that was draped in an American flag of one of our brothers. And I just couldn't stop looking at Staff Sergeant Thompson's wife and just seeing the grief and the pain. And I got filled with rage for anybody that disrespects what we are fighting for and what we stand for. And I showed Colin that text. And th at that moment, you know, his, I, I, I saw in his eyes, they kind of like, it really affected him, you know, emotionally. And uh, it, had a, it had, a, had a big impact on his next words, which were, I wanna do something different. And uh, we sort of came to a middle ground where he would take a knee alongside his teammates. Soldiers take a knee in front of a fallen brother's grave, you know, to show respect. To be said, I think that would be, I think, I think that would be really powerful. And, you know, he asked me to, to, to do it with him. And I said, look, I'll stand next to you. I gotta stand though. I gotta stand with my hand on my heart. That's just that's what I do and, and where I'm from. The protest raised a few eyebrows, but mostly it kicked off conversations in two places, sports circles and angry white races. Most of the rest country of the country remained completely oblivious to Kaepernick's protest. But there were some people who noticed, and they noticed very much. Those people were the franchise owners of the National Football League. Because you see, when Kaepernick opted for free agency in 2017, he went on the market looking for another team. And this is where things start to get tricky. And as you will see, Kaepernick, because I know jack and shit about the footballs. So when I say that Kaepernick was not a great quarterback, you should know I can't tell the difference between a great quarterback and a great quarter pounder with cheese. You came. I was alone. I should have known. You were temptation. The tempting taste of McDonald's alluring quarter pounder with cheese. Add fries and a Coke for an irresistible deal. But neither was Kaepernick a particularly bad quarterback. By all rights, he should have been picked up by another team quickly. And in a just world, Kaepernick would have been hired by some team and he'd be playing football right now. They didn't. And he doesn't. And actually, no team will touch Kaepernick with a 10-foot pole. Now, the owners all claim it has nothing to do with his political opinions or his protesting. Which, let me make it clear, it totally is. This blacklisting of Kaepernick for his politics inspired a handful of other players to kneel as well this season. Which brings us back to the tangerine turd sharding all over the issue. Which, in turn inspired almost 200 players, owners, and even one of the one or two of the singers of the actual anthem to take a knee in protest. Like with so many other things Trump related, his words had the exact opposite effect of what he intended. If in fact he intended anything, it is so hard to tell these days. Let's try to peel the layers off this issue, shall we? There are no rules anywhere outside of the U.S. military, requiring anyone to stand for the anthem. There is technically a law that describes how you deal with the flag that suggests you stand with your hand over the heart, but we have never, ever enforced that law. 
Without getting, again, any way back on it, people started standing for the Star Spangled Banner back in 1891 at West Point Military Academy before we, before it was even, or indeed we even had a national anthem. The Star Spangled was the de facto anthem, and it was played at sporting events, political conventions, etc. for years before being, being made official in 1931. Standing up, taking your hat off, putting your hand over your heart are just conventions people started doing along the way, but they are by no means legally mandatory. Kaepernick's decision to kneel during the playing of the national anthem is entirely within the bounds of acceptable behavior for, for the public. There are no rules in the National Football League requiring a player to even be on the field for the anthem or that a player stand for the anthem. Before 2009, the players were not on the field for the anthem. But then the Department of Defense signed a deal with the NFL and the other pro sports to insert hyper-patriotic, jingoistic bullshit into the pregame ceremonies with flights of jets and giant fucking flags and all the onanistic joy that is American football and sports in general so young people would more quickly sign up to go and fight and die in our country's forever wars. Hey, why don't you join the service? Join the fucking service. Join up and die. How do you expect to keep the country free if you won't die? I'm dead. I died in World War II. I'm fucking dead. Can you say that? Come on, join up and die. So, you know, standing for the anthem is kind of a guideline at best. The most abused point dropped like a fart in a crowded elevator is kneeling during the anthem is a disrespect to service members and veterans who sacrifice so much for our freedom. <laughs> this one really pisses me the fuck off as a veteran. Who the fuck do you think you are? Oh, that's an easy one. I got an answer for it. I took the oath twice. You want to know exactly how it reads? It reads like this. Quote, I, state your name, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me in accordance with the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The words anthem, flag, or football appear nowhere in that oath. No American ever died so you could punt on fourth and fucking long. Do you want to know? Do you want to know the real reasons American service member gave? their lives let me list them for you fucking chronologically freedom from britain to kill the indigenous people of the continent so make room to make room for white people to get booze taxes from our citizens to protect the ships of rich white dudes to prove to the british we were actually serious the first time we went to war with them to kill more indigenous peoples to force the mexicans to give us land we wanted to legalize the opium trade in china yeah we were in that war to keep a bunch of rich white southerners from destroying the Union, all because they wanted to keep slaves to kill even more indigenous people, to become an imperial power, to make sure rich white plantation owners could grow bananas and sugar cane, to kick German ass for sinking ships we were making money off of for the rich white people who were selling the armaments to the English and the French, to finish killing the indigenous people that we hadn't killed before, to defeat the Nazis and the Japanese who were bad people but were also cutting in on our action, to kill the commies who were cutting in on our action. That one applies to almost all the post-World War II wars. To keep the oil flowing in the Persian Gulf. To overthrow and arrest one of our dictators who stopped doing our bidding. To keep the oil flowing in the Persian Gulf Part Two and make us feel all manly after Vietnam. To keep Europe from imploding into World War III in the Balkans after the fall of the Soviet Union. To capture bin Laden but not really. And finally, to keep the oil flowing in the Persian Gulf, capture one of our dictators that stopped doing our big and bidding, and make George W. Bush feel like a man. Oh, wow. I mean, you really have, like, quite a list. Yeah. And again, football appears nowhere on that list. You know, a lot of veterans and people on active duty are quite vocal on their lack of being offended by football players kneeling during the anthem. Many of them have said it's the kind of thing they signed up to defend in the first place. Admittedly, other veterans are not so sanguine. It really comes down to one simple thing. One easy question that defines where you stand on the issues of this protest and all of the things that cause this protest. What, you mean, am I a racist? Mm-hmm. 
Because in the end, the only people who are upset about this are racist, bigots, and fucking assholes. We need a fucking Venn diagram for these people. Oh, I know, they don't see it that way, and they're very upset when people imply they're acting the way they do because they're racist, bigot assholes. So let me be very clear on this. I'm in no way implying that you are a racist if you are upset about the NFL protest. I am explicitly, clearly stating out loud for the record that you are in fact a racist, bigot asshole if you are upset about NFL protest. Guys, I can't make this any clearer. Because it's about cops killing unarmed black people. It's about black athletes making their voices heard, and it's about you and how you feel about black people being heard. It's not hard to connect the dots here, people. Let's take a skim through the right-wing derposphere and just read the headlines. Actually, no, no, don't do that. And do not do that and click the links. It's for your own good, trust me. You will behold a smorgasbord of raving, ranting, quivering rage about, quote, ungrateful millionaires, unquote, disrespecting the flag, the troops, mom, and apple pie, and God-given rights of Amer every American police officer to gun down an unarmed person of color while for just driving in a white neighborhood. That... Last bit might be a bit contextual rather than overt, but it's there. Apparently, we've replaced the term uppity with ungrateful and are also using millionaire in lieu of a racial epithet that they are equally as angry about no longer being allowed to say, but they're sure as fuck still thinking. Even those white people who think they're not racist, but are totally racist, say that protesting police violence is, of course, they're right, but they just shouldn't mix it with sports. It's funny, white people don't want black people to inconvenience them with their protest. And what do you suggest we do then? Oh, I don't know, pin sternly worded letters to traditionally black publication. Does Jet Magazine and, or Ebony even exist anymore? And by the way, white people were not at all in favor of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, despite what you might remember from watching the History Channel. Polling at the time reflects polling in our time. White folks called Martin Luther King an agitator, a communist insurgent, and an uppity, well, you know what comes after uppity. From a 1995 paper on Martin Luther King by a guy named Sheldon Appleton that I found, and he's linked in the show notes, quote, the overwhelming approval with which King is remembered today stands in ironic contrast, however, to the way he was perceived by white Americans when he was active. A number of survey items ask about King in the mid-1960 show him more reviled than revered. In fact, as one of the most disliked American political figures in the age of public opinion polling. White people are fine with black people protesting so long as white people don't have to see it, don't have to hear it, and don't have to know about it. What black people should not do is use the one social venue African Americans possess where white people will actually be exposed to their feelings. These Fucking white people aren't listening to black music, so that's out. The white people aren't listening to watching black television or movies, what very few of them there are, and they aren't reading black literature or even so much as following black Twitter. So African Americans are left the singular place in American pop culture where white people, particularly the white people who need to hear the words most, are actually paying attention professional sports. In the interest of disclosure... 80% of all NFL players are African Americans. Oddly or not, if you're based in reality, there are exactly zero black NFL owners. Do people not see the plantation effect there? No, they don't. Is it just me? Oh, wait, I think somebody might be able to comment on this. People go, oh, what's the difference? Here's the difference. Shaq is rich. The white man that signs his check is wealthy. It's slightly better the ratio in other professional sports, but only barely. A bunch of rich white dudes are getting rich on the blood and sweat. That's literal blood and sweat and traumatic brain injuries of African American men. Nothing new there, right? And those rich white dudes do not want their black men to do anything to mess with them getting the richer. 
And yeah, 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 yeah. The owners will make mouth noises about supporting their players after Trump turned it all over the Twitter sphere. But you notice they have not and will not hire Colin Kaepernick. And oh, let's not forget that most of the NFL owners donated to Trump. And this, all of that, all of that behavior, all of that repression, keeping Kaepernick out, donating to Trump, and just the the bullshit that is the NFL play, team owners is to remind their, quote, stars, unquote, with the big endorsement deals and multi-million dollar contracts that it can all go away in a heartbeat if they, the black men that play for them, cause too much trouble. So it's a genuine risk if a black athlete uses the soapbox of his ephemeral fame to advance the cause of justice for African Americans because the what the rich white man giveth, the rich white man can take us away. Which brings us to our way back. Find your way back. Find your way back to our heart. Find your way back. Find your way back. Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. was born in Louisville, Kentucky in 1942, one of six children and named for his father, who was named for an abolitionist politician. His family was two generations away from slavery and now were black middle class in segregated Kentucky. By black middle class in segregated Kentucky, I mean they were poor. Young Cassius Clay had his bicycle stolen one October in 1954 and approached a police officer working the event to report it stolen. When that police officer told young Cassius Clay that it was unlikely it would come back, the, and Clay said, well, I'm going to whoop whoever stole that bike, the police officer suggested that Clay probably should learn how to fight before he started picking fights. That police officer would become Cassius Clay's first boxing trainer and stay with him for the first six years of his amateur career. Is that a true story or not? Huh. It appears to be, pod friends. Cassius Clay would go on to have a stellar amateur career. 100 wins to 5 losses, winning the Kentucky Golden Gloves 6 times and the National Golden Gloves twice, and then boxing the 1960 Summer Olympics in Rome where he took home the gold medal in the light heavyweight class. But Clay did not find a hero's welcome when he returned to Kentucky with his gold medal. After being refused service in an all-white dining establishment, Cassius threw his gold medal in into the Ohio River in a fit of frustration over the endemic racism in America. You made that up. I did not. Well, I didn't make it up, but Cassius Clay did. He apparently just lost it like a year after he won it. Cassius Clay turned professional in 1960 and went on to become one of the greatest boxers of all time. Well, not Cassius Clay, but... Muhammad Ali, because Cassius Clay converted to the Nation of Islam and changed his name in 1962 after meeting with Malcolm X. Muhammad Ali was an incredible boxer and a genuine star. His personality, his braggacito, and his flair made Americans fall in love with the young champ even after he converted to the Nation of Islam. Ali was still in demand by promoters and popular with boxing fans all over America. And there were a lot of boxing fans in America. From the 1920s to the 1940s, boxing was the sport in America. By the 1960s, it was slowly being replaced by football as the American obsession, but it still commanded a lot of eyeballs in 1964 when, a when one Muhammad Ali told the draft board to go fuck itself and refused to be drafted to serve in Vietnam. Muhammad Ali was first ruled ineligible for the draft because he was not deemed mentally fit to be drafted, but the draft board changed their standards. You know, you all saw Forrest Gump. And then they drafted him. Ali considered himself, and he applied to be a conscientious objector, and he was denied. And when that was refused, uh, Muhammad Ali refused to serve in the armed forces. My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother or uh, some darker people or uh, some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never called me nigger. They never lynched me. They never put no dogs on me. They never robbed me of my nationality, raped and killed my mother and father. What well, I'm going to shoot them for what? How can I go shoot them? Them little poor little black people, little babies and children and women. How can I shoot them poor people? I would just take me to jail. Ali showed up at his induction call 
and then refused to step forward when his name was called. He did so three times, and after being advised that he would be arrested if he did not do so, he, uh, you know, persisted and was subsequently arrested. This upset a lot of people. Well, it upset a lot of white people. His boxing license was immediately revoked. He was stripped of his national championship title, and he was even denied a visa so he could go overseas and fight. He was blacklisted, no pun intended, from boxing, and lambasted in the media for his stance against the war, which at the time that he did this was not as unpopular as it soon would be. American TV host David Susskind was just one of the mildest detractors of Muhammad Ali. Well, I don't know where to begin. I find nothing amusing or interesting or tolerable about this man. He's a disgrace to his country, his race, and what he laughingly describes as his profession. He is a convicted felon in the United States. He has been found guilty. He is out on bail. He will inevitably go to prison, as well he should. He's a simplistic fool and a pawn. Even other black African athletes felt Ali were going too far when he refused to serve. Jackie Robinson and Joe Lewis both condemned Ali for his actions. And a lot of, you know, working class African Americans felt Ali was going too far and was acting un-American. Some even said Ali was rich and could afford to refuse when poor, poor black men did not have that luxury. But the truth is Ali spent all of the money he'd made in court cases to keep him out of jail. And it didn't work. Ali was convicted of draft evasion in 1964 and appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court where eventually his conviction was reversed in a unanimous decision and he was actually granted conscientious objector status. But over time, the public came to see Ali's refusal to serve as a noble act of self-sacrifice rather than being an uppity inward. Why? The big reason was everyone could see Ali was right all along. The war was a disaster. Black people were being treated like garbage. And if Ali was willing to give up all that he had gave up, fame, championships, wealth, for his belief, how could he be the bad guy? Reality actually won out over racism. I mean, how often does the universe allow that to happen? <laughs> Ali went back to being the greatest, although he missed the prime fighting years and began the inevitable slow decline in that age brings to a boxer. He was never quite what he was, but he was still the greatest. In 1996, he lit the Olympic flame in Atlanta and was given a replacement medal for his lost gold medal. Yes, Gavin, I assume they did check the couch for his gold medal. Ass. When he passed away in June of 2016 from complications of the Parkinson's disease, he died an icon of the civil rights movement and a legend in sports. And that, my friends, is a pretty good legacy. It's just a shame it cost him so much to acquire. And it's far too soon to know where Colin Kaepernick will land, but he's well on his way to living up to Ali's legacy. He spent nearly a million dollars in charities he supports, and he's working with the African-American community, community to teach young people their rights and how to deal with the police in, when they contact them. He trains constantly and says he's ready to play should the NFL unblackball him. But for now, he languishes in the metaphorical sidelines rather than the literal ones. He's remained quiet on the Twitler's latest blather, blather, but his mom summed up the situation most adroitly when she tweeted in response to Trump's insults, I guess that makes me one proud bitch then. The best mom in the whole world. And I guess we'll all know where the good folks all pissy about the protest will land. Some of them are showing the finest rational thinking by burning their NFL attire, and one moron even lit his very expensive season tickets on fire. Not the brightest bulb in the tanning bed. The usual call for boycotts and protests are making the rounds amongst the morons and will continue for another week or so when the mindless herds of simpletons will follow their dipshit leader over another cliff when he complains about some other minority not blindly licking his balls in adoration. This will continue until he strokes out mid-tweet on the shitter. If we're lucky, that will happen sooner rather than later. But I gotta say this. You are free to feel however you want to about black people protesting. It's your right not to watch football, even though we know you're full of shit and you're still watching it 
every fucking Sunday. You love football way more than you love America. How do I know? Well, you sure as fuck show up for football every Sunday, Monday, and Thursday. You wear the uniforms, know the players and the stats. It consumes your every waking thought from August through fucking January. You love it like I love Jameson and cynicism. If you were one-tenth as in love with America as you are with football, America might be a slightly better place. You really want to show me how much you love America and the flag and the anthem then amble your fat ass down to a recruiting station and put on the fucking real uniform of America instead of another man's jersey that hides your beer guts. Until then, your opinions and your thanks for my service mean fucking all to me because I got in the game. I made the big plays and I fucked all the cheerleaders while you were in the stands drinking beer. So don't tell me how much you love America. Show me, motherfucker. Show me. Oh, and while you're at it, try not to be such racist pricks. That would be great. Okay? That too would show me how much you love America and everyone in it. I won't be holding my breath for either outcome. After all, we're talking about a group of people who over the years were perfectly fine with dogfighting, domestic abuse, and murder. But hey, you know, kneeling, well, that's just unacceptable. As I told one angry father of mine on social media who suggested that if I don't love America, I should leave it, I do love my country. I just really fucking despise a subset of its citizens because they're real pieces of shit. Because the fundamental reason Colin Kaepernick had to take a knee in the first place is the inescapable fact that cops are treating African Americans with little, they're treating them little different than Bull Connor with his dogs and hoses. It's even worse in some ways because they're killing them in public where everyone can see and no one ever faces any consequences. The reasons there are protests in your fucking football is that's where the world really is watching it because it's the only place you will ever fucking notice with your heads buried in your phones and your intentional blinders brought on by your wife skin when you moan about the right place and the right time you tell me motherfuckers where is the right place when is the right time and i think i know your answer it's nowhere and it's never <laughs> that is it for our show this week I was going to talk about Puerto Rico and how American citizens are dying because our president believes they're somewhere over by New Zealand or something, or more likely he thinks Puerto Ricans are just Mexicans. But while people are actively dying, I don't think I should be making dick jokes. Apparently, my sense of decency knows some bounds. I would like, however, to give a big shout out to a pod friend who has a new podcast called Nothing Nice and Easy. You can find it by searching the show name on SoundCloud or clicking the link in the show notes. You will actually enjoy listening to this show because Kira knows what the hell she's talking about and she's got a silky smooth radio voice. We kill for that voice. If you want to help people listen to my high-pitched whiny voice, you should rate and review this show wherever you get your podcast so they can irritate themselves and their dogs. And then their dogs respond by covering their ears whenever I speak. You can... You should go right there and do the same thing. You can irritate your eyes by looking at my bad tweets and following the show at Twitter. Give me 280, Twitter. I want to do bad tweets twice as long at the hell underscore podcast with the show name on Facebook. All of the shows at the show name on SoundCloud are www.whatthehellpodcast.com. For me, Dave Bledsoe, the kneeling for a different reason producer Gavin. Dude! Look for your lucky D20 after the show. We're almost done. And all the other fictional protesters on this show, we want to say you can stand in line waiting for the kickoff time because you're a fat slob. When a man in the uniform, uniform takes a knee because his people aren't free and all you scream is, do your job, then you are just a real piece of shit. We'll see you all next week.
is the way it is Some things will never change That's just the way it is Ah, oh, but don't you believe it